translation that not only will you find different words used for it, not only was a word invented, loving kindness, to try to uh, capture it, but you also see other words that are drawn to it. It's almost as though this word has its own gravitational pull because it needs other words to come around it to help us see it, to help us understand it. Last week we, we explored and I, that, that chesed is something that even when we when we use these different words to help us understand it, it's not something that we can fully just understand by words. It's one of the reasons why music is so important and so powerful. Because music is a language that helps us to convey or understand things in a deeper and richer way. And throughout the Old Testament, right, chesed is almost always something that is sung about or put to music. Not only that, but we see that it's something that is not just something that we are to know about or even just to experience, but it's going to be something that we are to do. Well, what we're doing, as I, I shared last night, is we're going to seek to see this work in the New Testament, and specifically to see it in the life of the one who embodied Jesus. So John chapter 1 is where we're going to begin, because John uh, is going to, to use a phrase that is connected to our word chesed. And John, as he begins his gospel, is going to present Jesus. The one that he is not just writing about, but the one that he knew personally. Remember, John is one who had the privilege of being invited to be one of Jesus' closest followers. Jesus had many followers, but he invited 12 to be his closest disciples. The ones that he allowed to be with him in all, in all circumstances, to see him, to know him, to hear him. And John had an upfront view of Jesus. Not only that, and we'll get to this in a little bit, but John got to see Jesus in some extraordinary ways that very few other people ever did. And John wrote his gospel, right, his account of Jesus' life, because he wanted you and me and all who would read his gospel to know what he knew. And to experience and to have what he had. When you have something, when you experience something that's utterly amazing, this life transforming, that's eternity altering, you want others to know. And John is very explicit about that, that he wrote his gospel. Right? He wrote his gospel account of Jesus' life so that people would be able to see Jesus for who he was. That they might not just see him, but they might believe. That they might come to faith in Jesus as their Savior. And that by believing, they might have life in his name. So, John chapter 1, and as we come to John chapter 1, I want to invite you or ask you to do something this morning. 
I want you to use your imagination for a moment. How many of you would say I have a really, really, really well-developed imagination? Mm. All right, some of you. How many of you would say I have a, an okay imagination? All right, that's good. How many of you would say I have none, no imagination at all? Anybody? All right, a couple. There's always a few, and we're all, listen, we're all shaped and wired differently. But I want you to take your, I have what might be described as an overactive imagination. I want you to imagine Jesus as you might picture it. I want to imagine you sitting across the table or next to him at a coffee shop. And I want you to think about how do you see Jesus looking at you? How would Jesus look at you? And what would he say to you? I want you to, to think about that for a moment and we're going to weave that thought throughout the week. But in John chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, down through verse 3, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and all things were created through Him, and apart from Him was not one, not one thing that was created. Let me, let me pause there. Apart from Him, not one thing was created that He has, that has been created. And so John begins his gospel with a very, very familiar phrase. In fact, you might say, I've heard this phrase before. Where did you hear that phrase that he begins with? Where did you hear that before? Where did you read that? Somebody help me out. Yes. In the beginning. In the beginning. And where did you read that phrase? Uh, uh, what book of the Bible? Genesis. The very first book of the Bible. The Bible's very first words, in the beginning. Right? And John very intentionally starts his gospel there. And as John, who is writing in Greek, but as a Jewish person thinking in Hebrew, right? And he says, in the beginning, he takes this phrase, and he's not just borrowing it, but he's making and going to make an extraordinarily important and vital connection and a vital point. He says, in the beginning was the Word. How did God create the world? He created it through His what? Through His Word. And now John is going to take this word, Word, which had meaning to the Greeks, right? They understood this word, which is the Greek word logos. Right? They understood that this, to them, it was a philosophical thing, and it had an idea with the life force that was behind the world. And so some have speculated that John is taking that, that Greek thought and then applying to Jesus as possible, but it's really more of a Hebrew thought. The Word is how God created the world. And he says, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so John begins in the beginning. And he says, in the beginning, before the beginning, there was this Word. And he's going to reveal that this Word is Jesus, the eternal Son of God, the second person of the Trinity. He was with God in the beginning. All things, notice verse 3, were created through Him. And apart from Him, not one thing that was created has been created. Clear echoes of Genesis. And John wants his reader to know that the one he's writing about, Jesus, is the uncreated Creator. Notice verse 4. He says, life was in him. And that life was the light of men. That light shines in the darkness. And yet the darkness did not overcome it. Life was in him. John wants us to know that not only was Jesus alive, and he was alive as being both God and man. He had God's life. He is God. And he had human life. He took on flesh. He became man. And John says, I want you to know that, that he just wasn't alive. Life itself was in him. And he says, and that life was the light of man. You know, there's something incredibly beautiful about light, isn't it? Right? Light is a symbol of life. We talked about experiencing God's said in the morning. The, the dawn of a new day last week. We talked there's something about morning. Light brings light. Light also reveals. And so light, light brings light. It reveals. It shows truth. And it enables us to see what is actually there. And so Jesus came to show us who God is. He was God and he came to show us who God is and what God is like. And what God, what God re offers to us. And what he requires of us that light shines in the darkness. Then he goes on and he says in verse 6, there was a man named John who was sent from God. 
He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. The true light who gives light to everyone was coming into the world. The one who is light, the one who enables us to see and understand and experience. He is going to be someone, Jesus, that embodies Hesed. He is going to show us what this looks like. What, what God's covenant, faithful, loyal love actually looks like. He's going to show us not only what it looks like, but what it does. And he's going to call us not only to understand it and see it and receive it and experience it, but to live it out in our lives so that we can be transformed. Look at verse 10. It says, He was in the world, and the world was created through Him. Yet the world did not recognize Him. He came to His own, and His own people did not receive Him. And here, John is going to introduce a theme that, that really will run throughout his Gospel account. And that's the reality that although God Himself came into our world, and that He became a man, and He came to us, and He came for us, that many, most, were unable to recognize him. He was in the world. The world was created through him. He came into his own creation, and yet his very creation, the world that he made, mankind that he made, didn't recognize him. They didn't understand who he was. They couldn't see him for who he was. John makes it even more personal. He came to his own, his, the Jewish people. And his own people did not receive him. Throughout John's Gospel, we'll see that Jesus is constantly misunderstood. And maybe you can identify. How many of you say, I know what it's like to be misunderstood, because I'm misunderstood all the time. Anybody? All right, look around. Right, you're not the only one uh, that feels and knows what it's like to feel misunderstood. And Jesus was constant. And it's really sad, but it's, it's a picture of a world that was and is corrupted by sin. And sin isn't just something that we do or we don't do. Sin is spiritual. Sin is powerful. It's evil. It's dark. And it distorts our reality and our perception of reality. It blinds us. It corrupts us. But there were those whom by God's grace and mercy and kindness and love were able to see, were given the ability to see. And notice what it says verse 12, but to all who did receive him, he gave them the right, it's an important word there, the right, the authority, to be children of God. You know, we throw around the, the, the words child of God or God's child quite casually sometimes. Or we might even have the notion that everyone, all of us are God's children. But the Bible is very clear, although that God created all of humanity. And every human being is made in His image. And every human being is to be treated with dignity and worth and value because they are an image bearer of the very God who created them. But the Bible is also very clear that sin corrupts and destroys. And sin separates us from the God who loves us and created us. And that the wages of sin is death, separation from God. And so because of sin, we are not all God's children. But God, through Jesus, offers you and I the opportunity to become a child of God. And if you are in Christ, if you've trusted Jesus as your Savior, if you believed on Him, if you're a follower of Him, you are a child of God. That's who you are. That's your identity. And you have the right to be called a child of God. Not because you earned it. Not because you deserved it. But because you have been born from above. Born again, as John would describe us in, his, in John chapter 3. And so he says, to all who did receive him, he gave them the right. And it's all of grace. It's not, it's not we don't brag, it doesn't sound better than anyone. In fact, it's, it's humble. He says, this right is given to those who believe, who have faith in his name, who were born not of blood, or of the will of the flesh, or of the will of man, but of God. And then, verse 14, the word, Jesus eternal Son of God, became flesh, and He took up residence among us, or He dwelt among us, or some translations might say it like this, and it's very accurate, He tabernacled among us. Last week, if you weren't here, we talked about 
the fact that God invites us to see him and to know him as our dwelling place. That we can know that in him we are home. In him we have refuge. In him we have a safe place to not only worship him and glorify him, but to lament, to pour out our hearts before him, to seek him, to know him. But here it says that God himself right, made his dwelling place among us. And John said, we observed his glory. Remember Moses, right? His request for God. God, show me your glory. Right? And God took him up on the mountain one more time. And he passed by him in all of his glory. And after passing by him, he spoke to him. And he revealed his name to him twice. And then he revealed his nature to him. He said, I am a God who is compassionate and merciful. I'm slow to anger. Abounding in chesed. Maintaining has said to a thousand generations. I am a God who forgives sin. And I'm a God who upholds justice. And here, John in the New Testament echoes this and he says, We observed his glory, the glory of the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And there's our connection with Hesed. Full of grace and truth. Think about this for John. Right, John was somebody who could tell you, I was there, and I saw his glory. Right, there was a time where John, and Peter, and Andrew were invited by Jesus up on a mountain. And there Jesus transfigured himself. He, 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 his appearance changed from that of just a natural man, and to some of his glory, not all of them, but some of his glory began to be so much so that they were in awe. And Moses and Elijah, the, and, and Peter, remember, is overwhelmed by this moment, right? And they all were, but Peter's the one who would talk, right? He's always the person that has to talk, right? Are you with me? Sometimes on that one. And Peter's like, this is amazing. He's like, forget everyone else. Let's build some, let's build some, some, some tents here. Let's, let's stay here forever. So good. And John was there. John also saw Jesus risen from the dead. And John writes his gospel and he says, We saw, we observed, we beheld his glory. The glory of the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. It's my prayer for you, for me, for all of us this week, that we would behold his glory. That we would see God for who he is. That you would understand Jesus for who he is. And many of you, you already know him as your Savior. It's my prayer that, that you would go deeper in your understanding of who he is. Deeper in your understanding of his love for you. Deeper in his understanding of his purpose for your life. Deeper in his understanding of what God is calling you to do. That's what God did for me when I was here. Some of you may not be a follower of Jesus. You may not be saved. This might be strange sounding. Or you've heard it all, but you don't believe. It's my prayer for you that this one, that you would see God for the ones, that you would understand Jesus, that he really is the eternal God, the uncreated creator. He really did enter his creation. He really did reveal his glory. And he was full of grace and truth. It's such a beautiful picture. Truth is the number one word associated with chesed in the Old Testament. And Jesus doesn't just have grace. He doesn't just speak truth. He abounds. He is full of them. They are who he is. A perfect mixture of grace and truth. Last Friday, we ended chapel uh, in Luke chapter 7. And just very, very, very briefly, we touched on an extraordinary story. And I wanted to, this morning, enter that story and spend a little bit more time there. So Luke chapter 7, and we'll turn over a couple books in your New Testament. Luke chapter 7, beginning in verse 36. And, and I want to do this because I think this, this scene in Jesus' life helps us to picture what John is talking about. Right? When John talks about the uncreated creator entering his world, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Right? When he talks about the God who is light revealing himself to us, and that light brings life, and he talks about Jesus being full of grace and truth, we, we get to see that on display. And so I, I know for a lot of us, we need to see, how many of you say, I need to see it in order to understand it? Anybody? All right. You're a visual learner. Well, we are going to be talking and using words, but I want the, the truth of this scripture, I want you to see 
this truth. And so, beginning in Luke 7, 36, it says, One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house, and he took his place at the table. Now, this all sounds very very normal and very very reasonable. How many could say it's nice to be invited to someone's home for dinner? All right? I, I got an invitation to dinner on Saturday. And it was an amazing invitation and an amazing meal. And it was a wonderful time. And so here's this dinner invitation. A Pharisee invites him over to eat. Seems normal. Um, and so this Pharisee uh, invites uh, hosting a visiting rabbi uh, was something that was, was very common. In fact, it was often done for religious merit. Sort of it's their duty. But something is missing. Because it says that he invites him over and he just takes his place at the table. But in this culture, there was some etiquette that was to be done before someone would sit at the table. And there were three things that were, were, were common, at least. But one was a kiss upon entrance. Now, this is a different culture than ours. And so this would be equivalent like to a handshake, or a high five, or a fist bump, or hi. Are you with me? How many could say we live in a good time? Mm -hmm. Yes, we live in a good time. Right? But this kiss would have been a, a, a customary greeting. I went on a missions trip when I was in college uh, to, uh, to Chile. Uh, and I went on a few others. But Chile was the first international missions experience that I ever had. And it was an amazing experience. And wonderful culture, wonderful people, wonderful food. And it was extraordinary to just be together. But they are a kissing culture. And so we would go to a church service, and we would share and, and do that. And then afterwards, we'd all have to line up, and the whole church would come by, and everyone would kiss you on the cheek. Men, women, everyone. Right? It was a little weird. But that was their way of expressing greeting and expressing love. So that's what this culture would do. They would offer to wash your feet, right? Because you walked everywhere you went, and you wore sandals, and roads were dirty and smelly, and so your feet were what? Gross. Dirty and smelly and gross, right? And you reclined around tables so your feet were next to someone's face. And so there would be an offer to wash feet. And then there would be an offer of olive oil to refresh in your hair. And Jesus is offered none of this. None of This Pharisee offers none of them. And it's important to the story. So it says in verse 37, Behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, most likely a prostitute, when she learned that he, Jesus, was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster flask of ointment, an expensive, expensive bottle of ointment. Now, we're going to encounter this story, and it's, it's going to get kind of weird, and it's going to sit, feel awkward. And maybe you can identify, you say, I, I, I've been in a situation where I felt really awkward. Anybody? All right. Maybe your first experience, the first time you came to Chehi, you thought, this feels really awkward. Anybody say it was a little awkward when you first got here? All right. Yes. A lot of us. Right? Because it's a, it's a unique, strange place. Most of us, hopefully all of you will come to find out that this unique, strange place is incredible. That's why a lot of you keep coming back. Because you realize after a while, it was a little awkward at first, but it's amazing. In fact, I often describe Chehi as heaven on earth with cafeteria. <laughs> the awkward scene. This woman comes in, and that would have been awkward to begin with, because probably everybody there knew who she was, or knew of her, and they knew what she used to do. And she walks in, and it says in verse 30, and standing behind him at his feet, she was weeping, and she began to wet his feet with her tears. And she wipes them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with oil. Can you imagine being at this dinner? These men reclined around the table, chit-chatting about theology, about the weather. And all of a sudden this woman comes in and everybody's like, what is she doing here? This is weird. And she walks over to Jesus and thinks, this is weird. And she begins to weep. Just tears flowing. And we'll discover why in just a few moments. And as her tears begin to, to literally drench his feet, she notices it. And so she kneels down and she begins to wipe them with her hair. She kisses his feet and anoints them with ointment. Why? Because she has heard the message of Jesus. 
She's heard the words of Jesus. And she's never heard anyone talk like Jesus is talking. She's never had anyone speak to her the way Jesus speaks. Jesus speaks with words of compassion. Jesus speaks with words of grace. He speaks of words of patience and of mercy, of covenant love, of Hesed. And she knew that there was a deep emptiness in her soul. She knew she was lost. She knew she was a sinful person. She was broken and miserable. And she believed that this rabbi Jesus had something that she needed, had something that he could offer her that no one else had ever offered her. And so she comes to Jesus weeping at his feet, looking down and washing his feet with her tears and then wiping them with her hair. And all of this to the men, this is scandalous. Right, to this, just, just this display of behavior in public, what is so culturally inappropriate. And so the Pharisees are looking around and they're waiting. What is Jesus going to do? What's he going to say? The tension was thick, right? It is a very tense moment. She pours out this perfume on his feet. And it says in verse 39, Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, he's thinking, not out loud, he's thinking, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who, who this is and what sort of woman this is who's touching him, for she is a sinner. Right? He's thinking in his mind, Jesus claims to be a rabbi, he claims to be a man from God. And he's allowing this sinful woman to touch him. All he saw was a sinful woman. In his mind, he had categories of who deserved God's grace and who didn't deserve God's grace. Who had earned it and who hadn't. And this woman didn't deserve it and hadn't earned it. And I imagine he's thinking, Jesus needs to tell her the truth. Jesus, perceiving the situation, Knowing what he's thinking. You know, sometimes we think we know what someone's thinking. Are you with me? Like all of you have assumed. I know what they're thinking. How many of you have ever been wrong? Yes. Right? So we need to be really careful when we think. I know what they're thinking. But Jesus is fully God and fully man. He knows what this man, his name's Simon, he knows what he's thinking. Jesus has a, a real clear advantage in the situation. He said in verse 40, he said, Simon, I have something to say to you. And I imagine he's like, you, you've got something to say to me? What about her? And so he says, say it, teacher. And then Jesus shares a quick story about two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And Jesus says this, both of their debts were forgiven by this man. And he said, well, who will love him more? Simon answered, the one, he goes, I suppose. Well, you ever have to, ever have to like give an answer you didn't want to give? The one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And Jesus says, you have judged right. You have judged right. Then verse 44, then turning to the woman, he said to Simon. So picture, are you, are you, is your imagination alive and awake? Mm -hmm. Jesus is speaking. He's he turns towards the woman. He looks at her, but he's speaking to Simon. And he said, do you see this woman? And I think Simon's like, oh yes, Jesus, we all see her. <laughs> like, come on. Uh, yeah, that's why it's so awkward in here right now. Everybody sees her. Jesus, she's weeping and wiping your, wiping your feet with her hair. And she's pouring perfume and she's touching and kissing you. Yeah, we, uh, what do you mean do we see her? not what Jesus was asking. He's saying, Simon, do you see her as a human being? Do you see her who is one who is made in the image of God? Do you see her as one who's responding to my grace and my mercy and my love? He says, do you see her? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet, an intentional snub. But she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but he was forgiven little. He loves them. And in this story, we can see Jesus' compassion. We can see his mercy. We can see his incredible patience. 
and his deep love, his chesed. Anyone to the undeserving. And we're all undeserving. That was the point, but the Pharisee couldn't understand his own undeservingness. Jesus proclaims that this woman's sins are forgiven, washed clean. This is chesed, personified, on display for us. And notice what he says in verse 48. He pronounced that her sins were forgiven, but then he, he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Can you imagine? Can you imagine what she felt in that moment? Can you imagine how Jesus looked at her, how it hurt to hear those words? His eyes filled with his deep love. You see, the one who owed her nothing chose to give her everything. And that's the offer that God offers to all of us. Verse 49 says, Those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. I just want to give you three real quick takeaways this week from these two passages. Number one, Jesus is the uncreated creator. It, you, you need to start, I need to start with who Jesus is. The most important question that you could ever ask and answer is the question, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? There are lots of opinions about Jesus. Lots of opinions. But God revealed himself through his son Jesus. And the gospel writers, the eyewitnesses, They've given us their testimony. We have the testimony of Scripture. We have a God who revealed Himself. And Jesus is the uncreated creation. Not only that, number two, Jesus is the embodiment of Hesed. He is the embodiment of Hesed. He is Hesed personified. It is who He is. He came from the Father full of grace and truth. He shows us what it looks like. And then number three, Jesus offers his chesed to you. You see, the same offer that he made to this woman in Luke chapter 7, he makes to you. That if we come to him in repentance, if we come to him in humility, if we, having, and God has to do it, but if he has awakened our conscience and our understanding to not only who he is, but who we are, a sinful person, that he is a glorious God, he is the saving God, he is the God who can forgive sin and restore life and give grace. When we come to that place, when we come to that, that place, we can receive his offer of his sin. Salvation, forgiveness of your sin, eternal life. It's an offer to then, as a Christian, to deal with your sin. Because we still have sin as believers, and it doesn't separate us from God's love. It doesn't separate us from the relationship that we have now. Nothing, the Bible says, can separate you from the love of God that's in Christ for you. Right? Your sin can't. Your you don't keep your relationship with God by your performance. Aren't you grateful for that? But we still can sin, and our sin still has great impact in our life. And you need to see Jesus for who He is because He wants to forgive that sin. He wants you to deal with that sin. He wants you to deal with your shame. You may have come here this week. You may have been here for a couple of weeks. But you might be carrying some shame. There's some secrets. There's some things that you have done that maybe are known, but maybe not. Maybe it's a habit you're dealing with, a struggle, something that you're carrying. And you're carrying deep shame. And I want you to know that God not only offers forgiveness of sin, He not only offers you an invitation to become a child of God, but He continually offers you forgiveness for your sin and a removal of the shame. That you don't have to carry shame. Jesus wanted, He said, Go, He said to this woman, Go in peace. You don't have to be ashamed of what you did because you've been forgiven. Jesus himself would soon go to the cross and he would bear the weight of her sin. The reason he could say that, because he himself would carry the weight of that sin. He himself would experience the wrath of God for that sin. So that he could forgive. And so I want you to know that Jesus offers you a release from your shame. We began by thinking about how does Jesus picture you? How, how would he look at you? And what would he say? 
I want you to see that Jesus would look at you the very same way that he looked at this precious woman in John, in Luke chapter 7. And I want you to know the same salvation that she experienced, the same grace, the same forgiveness, and the, the resonance in her heart. Because once you experience Jesus, right, your heart begins to resonate in worship as she did that day. She worshiped by pouring out her perfume, probably what she used in her profession. Now she pours it out of his feet in extravagant. And then to live a life that reciprocates God's love. So let's pray together. Father, I thank you for your incredible love for us that you have most clearly made known through your son, Jesus Christ. I pray that this week that you would reveal yourself to us, that you would show us your glory, that you would allow us to see you for who you are. And Father, I pray that you would do a deep work in us. I pray for each person here this morning, each student, each counselor, each staff member, each faculty member. Father, I pray that they would know beyond a shadow of a doubt who you are, that Jesus is the uncreated creator, that he is filled with and embodied has sin, and that it is available to us, to everyone else, and that it brings salvation, that it cleanses from sin, and that it removes shame. And I pray that we would experience the beauty and the love that you offer us. And I ask this in Jesus' name.